Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, friends. Welcome to OnScript. This is Amy Brown Hughes, a co host for the podcast with Matt Lynch, Matt Bates, Aaron Heim, Drew Johnson, and Chris Tilling. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Joshua Ferris. No, not that Joshua Ferris, the decorated competitive figure skater that I found when I Googled our guest for today. Although I'm sure he's fascinating, we're talking with Dr. Joshua R. Ferris, the Chester and Margaret Pollock Professor at Mundelein Seminary at the University of St. Mary of the Lake. A beautiful campus, by the way, and on my list of favorite libraries. He's also a part-time lecturer at Auburn University, Montgomery, Alabama. And he was a visiting fellow at the Creation Project at the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and formerly assistant professor at of theology at Houston Baptist University. Thanks to Back- Baker Academic for sending me a copy of Joshua's hot off the presses book, An Introduction to Theological Anthropology, Humans, Both Creaturely and Divine, published earlier in 2020. What Joshua has done here is offer us an introduction to the huge topic of theological anthropology. It's an area he's familiar with, having published his monograph, The Soul of Theological Anthropology, A Cartesian Exploration, and having co-edited several volumes on the subject. With an introduction to theological anthropology, Joshua offers us an examination of the major topics in the discipline from a Reformed Catholic perspective. I'll let him explain what he means and what this particular traditional perspective brings to the table on this topic. If this particular tradition is a familiar lens for theological anthropology to you, I'm delighted we get to talk about it. If this particular tradition's lens is unfamiliar to you, I'm delighted we get to talk about it. We're going to talk about the body, the soul, science, and much to my college goth self's delight, we're going to talk about death. Alrighty, let's get started. Welcome, Joshua. Hey, thank you, Amy. It's good to be with you. All right, so... Uh, In the bio that you sent over, we're going to put on the website, uh, I have to ask you about this piece Uh, you have in there, raised a charismatic who later became a Southern Baptist and arrived at the Reformed Episcopal Church. That's quite a journey. I'm always, (laughs) I always find the ecclesial journeys of theologians really fascinating, and I'm sure our listeners do too. Would you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so as it says, as, as you stated already, I, I was raised a charismatic or Pentecostal. Sometimes those, those sort of uh, theological perspectives blend in certain circles, right? Uh, obviously, there's a distinction, but uh, that's where I was raised. And I, we spent a lot of time in the Assemblies of God churches. And uh, so I learned all about uh, speaking in tongues and and um, giftings, of course, and uh, miraculous healings and those sorts of things. That was part of my my sort of upbringing and, and uh, uh, theological heritage, I guess you'd say. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I made a profession of faith at the age of six, I believe it was, and I said the prayer and, and um, was baptized at the age of 10 uh, at a Pentecostal church. And... Um, and from there, most of my high school years, we were a part of an Assemblies of God uh, church, and um, it was a great experience. I mean, I would say I, I really learned uh, uh, how to pray with my charismatic brothers and sisters, and so it was um, it was uh, it was a good time in many ways. Um, and I guess during that time, uh, I, I during my teen years is when I really started to begin to grow and and started really practicing the spiritual disciplines and started hungering for the, the Bible and, and for, um, for spiritual nourishment as well as um, just recognizing my own sinful patterns and corruption. And so uh, simultaneous with, with sort of desiring the Bible and desiring more of God. And um, so around the age of uh, 17, 18, moving from high school into college, uh, there was a, a a gentleman who sort of took me under his wing, and he became kind of a mentor to me. Uh, uh, maybe I'm telling you more than you want to know, but uh, he <laughs> kind of became a mentor to me, and I, I learned uh, a bit more about the Bible. And that's one thing that I, I guess you'd say, uh, at least when we're comparing denominations, uh, one of the strengths of the Southern Baptist is like they read the Bible a lot, right? And they study the Bible. They have Bible studies. So that's 
Um, I guess you'd, you could argue that's one of their strengths. So um, during that time, I kind of wanted a more uh, intellectual faith. Not that I can't get that, and not that there aren't intellectuals in the charismatic circles. Oh, you're among friends here. I mean, I, I'm definitely a Pentecostal charismatic and still embrace that tradition as my own, as, you know, it's not something I've sort of veered from. But um, I I'm, I am think any, most of us in the tradition will go, yeah, there's a big anti-intellectual streak in there. So don't worry. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't want to offend any. Yeah, but that, that was my experience. There are yeah. strong things uh there um but that that was not uh pr- one of the particular strengths so um i did find some uh some other things in the southern baptist world especially under the the sort of the the discipleship of this this gentleman that was very helpful in my growth and and learning and just um sort of uh, uh i guess uh doing a bit of self reflection and criti- critical work on my own thinking about the christian worldview um, and that was very helpful. And so um, I went to a little a Baptist college in St. Louis and studied philosophy and theology there. And uh, that was a good experience. I mean, it was, I guess, really uh, a good experience more for um, the discipleship and for learning to be in a community with other people um, and how to think theologically about community a bit more. Um, I guess you should, we should be getting that in the church, but I, uh, in many ways, I didn't feel like in, in some respects, I didn't get that. So I got that at college that I had to pay for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, from there I went on to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, I was kind of inkling or, um, desiring the ministry a bit. So, um, I wasn't fully committed but uh, wasn't done with education, so I wanted to move on, and so I went there and and uh, pursued um, theological studies. And then after that, I I, I went on to uh, the University of Bristol, and I guess it was really there to some extent in my seminary education. I started raising questions about uh, the nature of theology in relation to the tradition and how that should maybe inform or um, how we should think about tradition broadly speaking and how that might. Uh, inform how we do theology and how we read the Bible or how we appropriate the Bible. And so those questions were really starting to impact me at seminary, although to a large extent, um, and many people would find this totally acceptable, to a large extent, my theological method was still very much uh, sort of me and my Bible. How do I I reason? Do I reason rightly? And um, have I properly exegeted the passages of scripture, right? Um, so um, when I went on to the University of Bristol to study under Oliver Crisp, um, my uh, theological method was expanded quite a bit there, uh, quite a lot. Um, and I, I started raising a lot of questions about the nature of tradition in relation to theology and uh, the nature of liturgy and the, the nature of sacrament and, and things of that sort. And so that's when I really started gravitating we were a part of a Church of England church there, uh, very much an evangelical, very low church, at least in style. Uh, I don't even remember the Book of Common Prayer used, but uh, but uh, Church of England still in name, at least, and connected the Church of England. But um, we weren't fully, I, uh, we certainly, my wife and I weren't fully committed to Anglicanism at that point. Uh, we just started to get a taste for it and t- started to begin to think about those things and develop some new categories for thinking about uh, church and ecclesiology. And um, so when we came to Houston, um, we moved to Houston, Texas, and we were still visiting lots of Baptist churches and things. And um, uh, I came from a more Reformed Baptist perspective uh, background. Um, many of the churches we were attending were not Reformed Baptist churches. So we, um, almost every week, it seemed like we had an altar call and that became the sort of liturgical structure of, of the Baptist churches. And, um, so, uh, I could say more about that. Uh, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) so, but from there, um, we eventually, we actually went to a, um, a short, we had a short stint at a vineyard church, and we love the people at our, at our little vineyard church. We love the community that we had there. And they loved us, despite, um, well, my, especially my theological, <laughs> my theological problems. Um, 
<laughs> so, but we were, we, we both loved each other and um, very loving people. They were very loving. Um, this was a church plant. They were moving in a sort of, it was called one river for a reason. And the metaphor was to bring, um, I guess, evangelicals and Catholics to the same river to drink. Mm. So they were really interested. If you know anything about, you probably know about the Vineyard Church, lots of Assemblies of God people move out of the Assemblies of God into the Vineyard for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whatever reason. And um, so um, they were very interested in liturgy and following the church calendar and all those things. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm on board with this. This is exciting. Let's see. But it didn't really last long. That vision didn't last long. Um, mm-hmm. Great people didn't last, though, that particular part of the vision. So um, eventually we, we tried out in a traditional Anglican church. And uh, long story short, uh, fell in love with the liturgy, fell in love with the service. In the beginning, at least initially, um, there were some Sundays where I was like, this feels a little dry to me. And, um, and uh, there could have been a variety of reasons for that, why that was the case. But after practicing it a bit, I just fell in love with the liturgy and um, the church calendar. And in many ways, I had already arrived in terms of how I was thinking about theology And I wanted to be in a more traditional sort of high church context. So hierarchy was still, uh, became more important to me Mm -hmm. later on in life. Um, And um, there's, obviously there's theological reasons for that. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more later. That's certainly interesting coming from, in contrast with a Pentecostal or charismatic background Mm -hmm. or a free church ecclesiology. Obviously there's differences there. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little weird, though, because, you know, I'm an early church theologian. So I spent <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I've, it's uh, it's definitely my tradition, but feel very at home. And, you know, I, sp- I study the Greek East. So, <laughs> I mean, we're all just really interesting combinations of things. And I'm glad you spent some time talking about this, because I think that there's um, a real sense of people trying to figure out who they are. And I, and I think it's helpful for our listeners to hear theologians talk about their journeys in this, because I think there's a sense in which you like, I don't know if we're expected to just like automatically know what church works or something. (laughs) Uh, I get asked a lot, like what church do you go to? You know, I'm like, well, you know, uh, let's talk about this and that. And I think there's a lot that goes into our, our particular journeys. Um, And, and uh, there's this assumption that, Oh, especially among, you know, uh, certain students who have experienced a lot of divisions in churches that like denominations are bad Um, and we all need to be one. I'm like, "Ah!" (laughs) let's back up and talk about what that would actually entail and and what voices would get quashed in the middle of that and and actually how that imposition could be a quenching of the Holy Spirit. And they're like, oh, oh, no. Ah, yes. So. Thank you for that. Uh, Let's do, let's shift towards um, talking about theological anthropology um, and do a little bit of an introductory orientation for our listeners, since you might be familiar with the idea of thinking about humans in relation to God, right? But what is, with this specific discipline, what is theological anthropology? What are the key questions that it explores? And what led you to be interested in this specific arena of theology? Yeah, yeah, good. Um, well, in short, a theological anthropology is the study of what it means to be human or the study of human beings in a theological context. So um, it is uh, theology specifically, um, when we think about systematic theology, we, um, we're, we're, we're thinking about uh, particular doctrines or doctrinal topics and how they're located or how they're related in a broader system of of, um, of, of uh, an understanding. So, um, I mean, you could think of this kind of like, you could think of a particular subject like theological anthropology, like, um, when a, when a professional photo- photographer, um, takes a picture they're and in many ways, they're not like sort of isolating or dissecting or separating what they're taking a picture of from the background, but they're focusing and they're trying to capture some aspects of that, a thing that they're taking a picture of. And I think in some ways that's what we're doing when we do um, 
systematic theological work where I, uh, in, in a sense, we're focusing or capturing something about um, God and particularly God's relationship to his creation, of which his human creation is, uh, you might say, the highest of all of his, his, um, his creation. And so we're, and, and humans are representatives of, of God to that creation. Um, when we're thinking about theological anthropology, we're thinking about it as it's informed by, or at least the way that I approach it, as it's informed by a dogmatic tradition, uh, by philosophical data, and we're thinking about it specifically as it's located in relation to God. Um, you might think of theological anthropology as one facet or aspect of the doctrine of creation. Um, and uh, some of the big questions that uh, that theological anthropologists ask are, well, what are humans constituted of? Um, and what does it mean to be a covenantal representative, um, right? Uh, or what does it mean to image God, right? That's a big theological anthropology question. What is it? And there, there's lots of different views on that. Some are not mutually exclusive. Some are. Uh, what is the final end or purpose of humanity? Um, what does it mean to be male and female if there is such a thing as being male and female? Um, what does it mean to be a person? Right, that's a big question, and um, there's lots of different answers to that. What is marriage, and who are we in relation to one another? Uh, certainly, both in creation and in in uh, in redemption. Um, uh, that that would be a slightly different answer when we think about humans' in relation to one another in redemption. So, depending on one's assumption of assumptions about humanity, she or he will begin with um, Adam uh, or through the lens of creation, or they'll begin with Christ, or they'll begin with, uh, many theologians throughout church history would begin with the Trinity. Um, and uh, those are different ways of sort of approaching the human initially. Um, so my interest really, um, I became interested in theological anthropology uh, I guess, really in seminary at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, when, uh, especially when I took uh, systematic theology too. So we had, so we broke up our, our systematics in three courses and we tried to cover all the topics in those three courses, which is quite, quite a lot. There's a lot missed, obviously, um, as you know. So uh, in systematic two, uh, we cover a little bit of theological anthropology. And in, in, that, um, in that particular course, we really, uh, I'm trying to think back. I mean, we did touch upon the Imago Dei, of course, that came up in, in our uh, systematic readings. But we really focused a lot on, on what it means to be male and female. And um, in some ways, that became sort of one of the, sort of the idiosyncratic lenses of the professors at that seminary and um, how they thought about anthropology. And so I had lots of questions still after that class. And it seemed to me, um, I had already been sort of interested in questions about human constitution as well, and what it means to, are we bodies or bodies and souls and things like that. And so uh, I was asking questions about those, those sorts of things. And it seemed to me, at least intuitively, that that may have a bigger uh, impact on other doctrinal topics. It may sort of color or, or shape how you think about other doctrinal topics depending on how you're um how you're you're working out the human constitution question and um so those became really big questions uh, uh, and of interest to me in seminary and actually that's that's what i um in general that's what i proposed for my doctoral work uh, before i went on to the university of bristol and that's what i wanted to focus on is particularly the constitution question and exploring a particular um view on constitution and how it how it might impact or um, what it might look like in conversation with other doctrinal topics. So I, I, you're already starting to answer this question, but I want to uh, you know, hit it very specifically. So there are other introductions to theological anthropology, of course, and you engage many of them in your book. Uh, but your introduction aims to engage the questions of theological anthropology from, through a broadly reformed lens, specifically a reformed Catholic perspective. So what spurred you to sit down and write this book? And what does this traditional lens, 
which is is quite broad, even as it is specific, <laughs> um, offered to an even broader conversation of theological anthropology. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, so as I began to think about this subject, um, and as I was reading through some of the introductions over the various, over the, the, the years, um, there, obviously, as you said, there's very specific sort of um, niche sort of introductions. Uh, there's like, um, I think it's Michelle Gonzalez's um, feminist introduction to theological anthropology. There's a few Roman Catholic theological anthropologies. There's uh, several philosophical anthropologies that, over, um, that overlap with these sort of biblical and theological questions about humans, particularly some of J.P. Moreland's works, which have been very influential in my thinking. Um, uh, yeah, so there's just quite a bit. There's, there's, there's um, uh, more moderate evangelical approaches, um, introductory approaches like Paul Jewett's work, uh, Ray Anderson's work um, on the human. There's um, Kelsey's, David Kelsey's very important work, Eccentric Existence, and um, several others. Uh, Mark Cortez, I think we mentioned him already. Cortez's works are really important right now, in my opinion in the evangelical world. But um, it didn't seem to me, at least in, a, in an evangelical context or in a broadly reformed, and I'm, I, I am probably using, I'm expanding the boundaries of reformed quite a bit, um, and I define it in, in the book or give some description to it in the book. Um, it didn't seem to me like there were, there were a lot of evangelical or broadly reformed introductory theological anthropology. So there, there is like, um, there's one that's commonly used um, in, in various Reformed or pr uh, Presbyterian, particularly Presbyterian seminaries. There's, um, I'm blanking on his name right now, Hokema. Anthony Hokema's yeah. mm -hmm. very, very accessible introduction, which I think is, is good in many ways. It's helpful. Uh, uh, although it, in other ways it's very general and he doesn't touch on a lot of issues. Anyway, there's several others we could mention that are that are uh, that that contribute something to um, to the discussion. So I wanted to offer something that I thought was more accessible that did try to cover a broad set of issues and expose the reader to a broad set of perspectives and theological persuasions, but also sort of harmonize it in a way that is. Um, broadly reformed. Um, so by that, I mean, at least informed by the sort of confessional traditions. So when I, when I think of a reformed ecclesiology, what I mean by that is um, a confessional ecclesiology. Um, and so confessions form an important sort of lens or basis by which we approach uh, doctrines and by, by which we put together theological uh, views. Uh, by Catholic, um, well, I think um, what I what I intended there, uh, and we're seeing some of some interests in in the evangelical world to be more Catholic in the sense of at least being more Catholic in the sense of being universally connected to the broader um, Christian communion, uh, and and um, so I add a little bit more. Uh, flesh to that by saying, well, what I mean by Catholic is uh, thinking about the human being through the lens of the broader dogmatic Catholic tradition as seen and carried along in, um, in the uh, ecumenical statements and in the creedal statements. And so uh, those lenses, uh, as well as sort of just normative dogmatic practices and doctrines that have been um, uh, commonly accepted in both the reform circles, Anglican circles, as well as Roman Catholic circles, um, uh, thinking about the human through those lenses and thinking about them and how they impact how we think about the human. Well, there's a sense um, when I was reading your book, because I, I, I think you pulled it off <laughs> um, because there, because you know, the reform tradition is one that I've spent time in, but it's not, you know, one that's mine, right? So it, I, I saw those distinctives in there, that the voices that you brought in, the particular categories, those were familiar to me through some of my schooling and that kind of thing um, and, and, and such. But there was also a rootedness 
to it that I really appreciated, um, where you spent some time in, you know, drawing in early, ch- you know, early church theologians. It was nice to see, you know, people like Nazianzus in there and like some, and not just the, you know, typical like, oh yeah, Augustine. And then, you know, moving on <laughs> to, uh, you know, bigger fish to fry sort of thing. So there was a sense of rootedness. Uh, so even though there was, um, some different emphases or it, there was a particular tradition lens there it because of the 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 catholic portion of that that you were uh, intending to to bring in as well sort of that that push into ecumenism or or like a I mean, maybe not a push, but like a, an open hand toward maybe might be a better way of putting it. Uh, I, I think there was a sense in which um, you invited um, a, a broader sort of selection of the church to the table where you could kind of have some places of engaging in, in commonality, but also recognizing a, a distinctive um, perspective in the tradition that has something to offer. So uh, I appreciated that. So Good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Gregory's pretty important, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> and I work specifically on Nyssa, so I was happy to see him in there too. So uh, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we can talk about him another time because, you know, I can talk about him all day. We don't have all day. So let's get into your book. I Each chapter is framed around a what, who, or a why question. You, you know, slip one win in there, I noticed. So what am I? What does it mean to be free? Who am I at birth? Who are we in culture? I appreciate some of the individual and then some of the communal language here. Why am I here? Why do I exist? And yes, my friends with OnScript, Joshua Ferris apparently wants you to have an existential crisis. So (laughs) be prepared. Each chapter gives a survey of perspectives and options on the topics at hand. So I want to open with a rather, you know, basic question, hilarious, regarding biblical language. Um, So is it... Uh, you could talk about this, I'm sure, for a long time because, you know, it's one of those sort of nerd journeys here. So let's try to keep it sort of brief. What constitutes a human person according to scripture? What are the terms scripture uses and what are the current discussions around this? You mentioned your interest in the constitution of a person. So I thought, let's start with the scriptural language because I've noticed that when I talk about this with students, they go, I had no idea. There was so much there. So go for it. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. And if you want more, then I'll let you sort of prompt more. Um, yeah. So I, I think uh, uh, in, in much of the, 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 the literature, the contemporary biblical and theological literature on the constitution question, it comes down, down to a question of uh, really monism versus dualism. That's commonly the question. And so we have, we have several, um, important historical treatments on the subject. And, and, and more recently, some of the, the, probably the two most important sort of um, treatments in conversation have been John Cooper's book, uh, Soul, Body, and Life Everlasting, and uh, Joel Green's book, um, Body, Body and Human Life. What's the title again? Body and Human Life. Um, that's not quite right. Um, it'll come to me in a moment. But anyway, it's Joel Green's a uh, book where he defends basically a monistic view of humanity. And monism is just the view that we are uh, ontologically one kind of thing, right? Whether it be a body or uh, a sophisticated body or something like that. And then dualism is the view that we are, and it's the view that I am inclined toward. And obviously in the book, I'm inclined toward it. Um, and I think the tradition is inclined toward some kind of dualism. Um but it's the view that we are body soul composites or body soul compounds, and that um, the soul is somehow important to uh, who we are or uh, to our personal identity. And um, so, when we look at the biblical language, I think there's there are several key or important texts that we need to uh, wrestle with and 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 think about that I think do lend themselves. And this is obviously debatable and controversial. But I think they do lend themselves to a sort of dualistic conception of human beings. Um, uh, one one text is Second Corinthians five one to ten, which um, traditionally, by many, of course, uh, following Thomas Aquinas and his commentaries, he interprets it this way. He interprets it as a kind of disembodied intermediate state, or that's at least what it's referring to. And so it's 
So it is a it is a passage, an eschatological passage about um, about human beings. But Thomas is quite clear that this is different than what we see in First Corinthians fifteen. It's a different state, mm-hmm. um, and so I think that interpretation is not uncommon in much of the wider tradition, and it's picked up in many cases by Reformed theological interpreters when they read that passage as well. There are, obviously in contemporary biblical scholarship, there are debates about exegeting that passage in that way, Um, but we won't go into those right now. So (laughs) um, there's even even a bigger debate in Old Testament studies right now about um, monism versus dualism and um, I don't. I don't know if I don't know if this is the consensus, but I think there's a common um, belief that uh, most Old Testament uh, interpreters or theologians believe that uh, the Old Testament lends itself or yields a sort of monistic conception of human beings altogether, and so there really is little to no place for a sort of dualistic conception of of human beings, and um, and. A lot of uh, a lot of theologians, as well as biblical scholars, hold that view or believe that to be the case. Um, I think there's um, some debate there that that still needs to be had. Uh, Richard Steiner has written a recently an important book in Old Testament studies called "Disembodied Souls," and um, so he argues that. Um, that nefesh in certain Old Testament passages necessarily needs to be translated as soul, referring to a kind of disembodied soul. And he argues that this is not only a common part of the ancient Near East and common part of the sort of the worldview of the Old Testament believers, but it is also part and parcel of, um, in certain key passages, part and parcel of God's action, uh, important to God's redemptive action, and bringing about redemption uh, to to the world, so he argues that in fact the Old Testament does yield a conception of human beings that is not monistic, but is actually dualistic in nature, or, or uh, as many theologians put it, dichotomous in nature, so that we are soul bodies of some 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 sort of arrangement, and um, that we can exist or persist beyond um, physical death or somatic death. And um, so he examines certain passages. It's a fascinating and helpful book. And so uh, in my uh, introduction, I give um, some argument to that effect. And I even go a step further and make it uh, even an even more, um, more controversial claim for many theologians. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I think that the term, anytime we use dualism, right? I think we, there's just sort of this wholesale, worry about the term. Um, and, and I get that from in certain er- areas in, in Christian, in, in theology, right? Like, uh, I think, um, I think there's an assumption among many Christians, uh, from a variety of, of, of stimuli that <laughs> makes us think this, that God and Satan are like, there's a dualism there, right? When there isn't a dual or good and evil. Like, so there's certain kinds of things that are sort of colloquial dualisms that are really problematic in theology. And, and I think that if you have a dualism that sees the body as ancillary or completely unimportant, and it, you run into some really difficult problems, right? Um, but and I, I appreciated your working through this and kind of wading into these perhaps piranha infested waters <laughs> uh, <laughs> of people coming at you for this, because I, I, I think that looking at the different language in the text and looking at the tradition, it's really hard to argue that that's not there. Um, and I don't think, and I think that the church has gone back and forth on this. Like the body is important. The body's not important. The, um, the body's very important, but in this kind of particular way, and how is it connected to the soul? And, and it's just, and it's distinct from the soul. It's not as distinct as we think. And I think that there's, there's a necessary kind of tension there, which even tells us right off the bat, right? That there's some kind of, um, dichotomy, even if it's not a positive or negative thing, um, or even like I often tell my students, you can't cut off your big toe and go, Oh, there goes my soul. <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way. So it's not as discreet of a, of a dualism, um, in the way that we often, um, 
that it's characterized sort of in, in simplistic ways. Um, I often think of a David Bentley Hart quote that I use in my Trinity section a lot about how much we prefer synopsis to precision and things easily characterized in taxonomies, right? And I feel like theological anthropology about the constitution of the person, you have to have some kind of precision in order to demonstrate where you don't know what things mean. Because <laughs> if you go the synopsis route, you actually end up potentially going into some where you have implications about human nature that can be really damaging theologically, right? So anyway, thank you for wading in, wading into the waters. In every chapter, you offer a clear, clear direction on the distinctives that the Reformed tradition offers. So I appreciated this as someone, as we've mentioned, that it's not from the Reformed tradition. One that I found particularly compelling that runs throughout your book is the emphasis on hearing and seeing. I particularly enjoyed um, your bringing back the seeing aspect for discussion on the beatific vision at the end of your book. And I noticed um, the engagement with Hans Borsma in there and such, which um, uh, the heavenly participation book. No, it's uh, what the other one that he wrote. He's, he writes so many books. <laughs> it's the one that he wrote on the beatific vision. Uh, would you talk about this emphasis on hearing and seeing and what it brings to the discussion of theological anthropology? So specifically, maybe the seeing aspect, but even how they connect. And even though I'm skipping way ahead to the end of your book, I think talking about the beatific vision here would give our listeners a sense of the cohesiveness of emphasis and narrative that you do offer throughout the book. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Great question. Lots of great questions here. Um, I uh, so I <clears throat> I do um, sort of touch on this this notion of seeing or or vision in every chapter of the book, and so this becomes a sort of a big theme that sort of um, encapsulates or ca- uh, organizes a lot of the other doctrinal themes or topics in the rest of the book, and so it becomes an important theme in how we think about what it means to be human and what, what, what our, what our purpose is. And, um, the vision is something that has, uh, uh, this idea of the vision of God or, or seeing God is something that's sort of fallen on hard times in contemporary theology in many ways. And in many, um, many evangelical contemporary theologies, it's sometimes it's not even discussed at all, or it's it's not very important, or it's not it's certainly not central to the vision of humanity and how we how we think about humanity uh, in general. Um, and uh, this is certainly out of sync with, I think, pretty clearly the broader um, Christian tradition or Catholic, uh, uh, lowercase c Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but Roman Catholic as well, um, Catholic tradition. Um, and so in the book, um, this becomes a pretty important theme. Uh, and uh, it's one that uh, I, I guess I expand a bit uh, from, from, I guess, where um, maybe medievals might uh, interpret the vision. Um, um, uh, I don't give it, uh, I guess, uh, I, don't, I don't specify the nature of the vision so much so um, that, uh, it, 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 it's no longer sort of functional or usable in, in, in uh, other contemporary theological developments. I think it's, I, I still think it has some, some importance, um, whether, whether or not you reject the sort of medieval worldview, um, it still has some, some importance in our, our theological construction. And so, um, I also develop it, uh, I, I develop it as a, kind of a capacity of the soul and um, I see it as um, as uh, as helpfully overlapping with this notion of hearing and I think uh, the notion of hearing is important in scripture when we think about um, uh, the gospel call and responding appropriately to the gospel call or when Jesus uh, calls his disciples there's this sense of hearing that's that's an important theme or metaphor in the Gospels. And um, in John, when it describes um, the sheep and uh, calling the sheep, uh, those who are, who are of the fold will hear Christ and they will understand and they'll follow, right? So a part of hearing means following and, um, and, and becoming disciples of Christ. 
And so that becomes an important theme. And arguably, it becomes a really important theme in Reformed anthropology specifically and uh, theology generally. Um, and certainly, uh, 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 Robert Jensen has picked up at the, uh, on this notion in a couple of places, um, this notion of hearing and the importance it plays in our construction of, of humanity. Um, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, it becomes pretty crucial to how we think about humans in the wider Catholic tradition and specifically in the Reformed tradition. When um, there, I think there's this, there may be this, this, this understanding or this, this assumption that the Reformed theologians uh, were not interested in this notion of vision, but rather they pick up this notion of hearing instead of vision. And so they kind of, in, in their rejection of the sort of uh, uh, medieval worldview or in the rejection of Roman Catholicism, um, sometimes there's this idea that uh, they, they sort of chuck out this, this vision language as well. Um, but I think that's probably inaccurate. And I think, um, I think we, uh, we've seen a sort of renaissance of contemporary literature that's trying to revise this concept and trying to show that actually, in fact, it functions quite in quite important and significant ways in many of the, in, uh, many of the key reform theologians, certainly in Jonathan Edwards, uh, John Calvin, we also see this in, in many of the um, catechetical statements in the Reformed tradition, in uh, the Westminster Catechism and um, the Second London Baptist Catechism, if we can expand Reform to include Baptist. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's a pretty important and s- even central concept. And as I've begun sort of thinking about beatific vision and um, rereading afresh uh, the uh, scripture and the gospels, it's, um, it's uh, certainly become more impactful on, uh, uh, on, uh, on certain aspects of scripture than I had realized before. And so, yeah. So anyway, it becomes a pretty important theme in the book. Yeah. That's great. And uh, I appreciated uh, your reflection on this because I think I had some of those questions about the assumptions from the Reformed tradition. So I appreciated you um, working through some of those in the book. So we're going to take a short break and we're going to do our speed round now, the on script speed round. Okay, you ready? Here we go. I I don't know what these questions are. You do not. You do not. You have no preparation. So tea or coffee? Coffee, absolutely. (laughs) If you could compete as any professional athlete for a day, just for a day, who would it be? Any professional athlete. Wow. Um, this might say a lot, but the first thing that came to mind is uh, mixed martial arts fighting. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Don't look so, into that too much. <laughs> so what's the most significant book in theology in the last 50 years? Oh, wow. Um, I don't, that's a, yeah, what's the most significant book in 50 years? You don't necessarily have to have liked it. It's just significant. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and I, if I had time to analyze it, I would say this is wrong. Um, and I know <laughs> lots of theologians are going to totally disagree with this. Totally disagree with this. Um, <laughs> Warranted Christian Belief by Alvin Plantinga. Okay. Uh, back to some, uh, an easy, maybe a softball. We'll see. Which Disney princess are you? Uh, Disney princess. That's an interesting <laughs> <laughs> Now you're throwing me off. Yeah. Um, uh, which one would I want to be? Ariel. <laughs> nice. Uh, you have your own late night talk show. Who would you invite as your first guest? Um, Could be living or dead. Living or dead. And don't say Jesus. No, no, I won't. <laughs> no. no. Uh, yeah. Living or dead. Uh, Bruce Lee. Ooh. On the <laughs> on the martial arts uh, sort of end of things here. So, uh, what's your comfort movie? Comfort movie. Um. Uh, yeah, a comfort movie. Um. Well, one that. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Comfort movie that I go back to quite frequently is Vincent Price's "The Last Man on Earth." <laughs> That's awesome. 
If you got a day to hang out with any theologian, living or dead, who would it be? And why? Any theologian, living or dead. Uh, maybe Wolfhart Pannenberg is the first one who's coming to mind right now. Okay. All right. I'd like to spend some time with Pannenberg. If, if you're like me, every time I ask this question, I have to cycle through my brain. Who would actually be enjoyable to be around <laughs> for a day? Because some, some of the people I enjoy reading might not necessarily be the person I want to spend a day with, right? Uh, what is your favorite magical or mythological animal? Maybe the, um, the three-headed mythological monster or dragon, Cerebro. <laughs> They're, yeah. 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 Cerebrus? Yeah. How do you, how do you, yeah. And then what's one idea in theology you think needs to die? One idea in theology that needs to die. That's a controversial one. You can choose to, you can choose to be controversial or you can choose not to be controversial because I'm not going to ask for a follow-up. So you can just let it hang in the air if you want. <laughs> I can see you just trying to decide if that's what you want to do or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, I think, I don't know if it needs to die, but it, it um, this sort of, well, this overemphasis upon relational ontology. Hmm. <laughs> uh, that's all, actually, that's a little controversial. Um, you can't see this, my friends, but he grimaced when he said that. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for playing. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you back to an easy question for you. So uh, you, you address a bit, very big question in your book. So I'm just going to ask it. Uh, we'll, we'll try to have not, you know, you don't need to read your whole book to us here, but what is a soul? And what relationship does it have to the body? Um, what is the soul? Um, actually, yeah, this isn't always, a, there, there's an easy way to answer this and there's a difficult way. Um, a soul is, uh, is a, a substance. It's a property bearer. It's a certain kind or certain type of property bearer that's um, uh, with, with certain characteristic properties of consciousness, phenomenal experience, reason, uh, morality, and volition. And these are all properties of the soul that characterize the, the type of substance that it is um, that are uh, not, um, it, certainly not explic, uh, explicitly, explicitly um, explained by um, the body, uh, not reducible to the body, certainly not identical to the various parts of the body. Um, so, um, so yeah, a, subs a soul would be a certain, a certain type of substance of consciousness. And um, its, rela its relation to the body. Well, persons, on my view, persons are strictly speaking or essentially related to their souls. And they're contingently related to bodies. So um, if the disembodied intermediate state doctrine is true, well, it would make sense that uh, we are... The, at least the most natural or intuitive understanding of the disembodied state is that we are souls, right? Or at least we are essentially related to our souls, but contingently related to our bodies. Thank you for that, because that is a great segue into uh, my second to last question for you. So your chapter on death, I had to get there, was really interesting because while there's several books focused on the resurrection Recently, I can think of a few other than the several that you mentioned. But as you know, there's not much as much focus on this interim state, right? Uh, what happens after we die, but prior to the resurrection? First, why do you think that is? And second, what happens to us after we die, but before we are resurrected? And maybe lay out a couple of those options and, and talk to us about a Christian hope that includes substantial care for our disembodied selves. And I, I'll, I'll say this uh, in addition to this. So the, the work that has been really, has really stuck with me on, on this question has been, I'll, I'll, I, had to, I had to bring him in at one point, Gregory of Nyssa's On the Soul and the Resurrection in his conversation with Macarena. And where he asks a variety of questions, basically what happens to he asked that question about the relationship between the soul and the body at death and what happens if your body is basically disintegrated, 
for some reason, right? And and we get this pastorally now, like what happens in the resurrection? How will my body come back together for resurrection? Like what's that? And uh, Macarena tells her brother that if I could paraphrase, there's no such thing as a homeless soul and there's no such thing as a body without a soul um, in its proper state. So the soul is like, it's like a, a, a like it, it holds the specificity and the blueprint of what it means to be physic the embodied person, and so it's not the proper state to be disembodied, but it's also a state that God holds in blessedness. So that's where I, that's where I'm starting from. So, uh, but I wanted to hear. It, it excited me when you started talking about this because you're right. There's a lot on the resurrection, which I'm super stoked about. Love the resurrection. <laughs> But even pastorally speaking, right, this interim state is where a lot of the worry actually is. Yeah. So as you, um, that's a great book, by the way, on the soul and the resurrection. Everybody should read that. Every Christian should read that book, right? Cosine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a lot of work recently uh, – on on the resurrection, and there's been a big emphasis on the resurrection in in, in recent theological and biblical studies, and um, so much so almost to the, um, the the sort of exclusion of this sort of doctrine of the disembodied intermediate state, as if it's no longer sort of important. So many um, who talk about the the resurrection, physical resurrection. And to actually affirm a, some kind of intermediate state, um, well, they just don't talk much about it or have much to say about it, or it's just a sort of it's treated as sort of a negative, sort of diminished state of existence, which you might argue it is. It, I mean, it is a diminished state of existence in some respects, but um, there's very little to say about it. However, in in the wider tradition, there's a lot to say about it, and and a lot of theologians. Um, do say quite a bit about it. It's pretty important. And um, it's important for some of the, the reasons that are mentioned in, on the soul um, and the body, um, on the soul and resurrection, that book. Um, that's the title, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important for uh, one reason for coming up with some sort of coherent account of how it is that we as persons survive our deaths. So I think that in that way, it's important. It's important in another respect, and I think um, this is almost completely lost. Although, although to some extent, uh, we, we do we do still hear about this and so, sort of in 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 preaching, um, this idea that um, there's something to be hopeful for after we die because we're going to be in the presence of God, and I think that's where the intermediate state really becomes pastorally relevant. Uh, so if you think about it, when you're um, when you are preaching or when you are counseling someone on their deathbed, this becomes really practically important. I think so. You you can either say and and um, uh, you can either emphasize the physical resurrection of the body. Hey, someday you're going to be resurrected, and I look forward to seeing you again. And and certainly that's part of the 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 hope of the, the Christian. Uh, but there's another piece to that hope, and that's uh, w- what you might call the immediate hope of the Christian. So, um, so imagine this, somebody's on their deathbed, and you can actually say to them, I mean, if you believe this to be the case, hey, um, when you die, you've been a faithful Christian, you're going to be in the presence of God when you die. That's, that's pretty hopeful. Hmm. And um, that's pretty important. And I think in, in many ways, theologically, if we just focus on the physical resurrection and we never talk about the intermediate state um, or we just don't believe in an intermediate state, well, then we, we miss something that's practical and, and very pastorally relevant to, to, uh, to Christian believers. Yeah, you address the soul sleep um, perspective. Uh, which I, I was very appreciative of. <laughs> I was like, exactly, what do we mean by this here? <laughs> um, and and I, I, I appreciated your approach to this because I think there's a sense of, of where it's almost like souls are like in a holding pattern of some sort, 
And it seems, I don't know, anticlimactic, maybe, <laughs> uh, to be sort of glib about it. Um, and, and, and you gave words, I think, to some of my discomfort around, I knew that that wasn't the perspective that was, that was something I was, um, particularly interested in, but it really gave words to some of my discomfort with it, uh, which I was appreciative of. Um, if you could maybe just give, uh, a, a, a brief introduction to what that is, if some people don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sometimes in the literature, it's a bit uh, confusing to figure out what people mean when they're talking about soul sleep. So, um, so uh, John Cooper in his book, Soul, Body, and Life Everlasting, talks about different perspectives on, on the afterlife or personal eschatology. And so he describes, um, well, broadly speaking, three different views. There's uh, what he calls the the um, disembodied intermediate state, which is what he defends in his book. There's what he calls the um, extinction and recreation view of the person or the self. And then there's the immediate resurrection view that uh, somehow there's, we're just, there's no time lag. We're just immediately resurrected, maybe in a different time um, frame or something like that. Um, yeah, in soul sleep doctrine, as I mentioned in my book, there's there's a couple different ways you could maybe understand this, and but many times when you read theologians talk about soul sleep, they're just talking about a sort of annihilation, yeah, sort of view that you just kind of cease to exist, you just go out of existence, which is like materialism, but somehow magically the resurrection. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. Which is really. <laughs> <laughs> hard for me to believe that that that's the case or that that could happen um yeah so sometimes soul sleep just is a maybe a nicer way of 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 talking about extinction and recreation mm -hmm. that we go out of existence and then we're recreated at a later time maybe it means something like um souls really are inactive but they're still existent in some way or persistent um, so that, but that, that sort of, that sort of under, that sort of, uh, term is often hard to, uh, disambiguate in, in some of the contemporary literature. Well, and there's a, a real sense and, and I got this in, in what you wanted to do. And I thought this was so important is, is, and I, I think that you see this in some of the people who do really focus on the resurrection almost to the point of <laughs> not focusing on the, on this interim state. Um, it's almost like they assume it, but don't say it directly, that there's a continuity between our, the selves we are now and, and the selves we will be in the resurrection. But the question then would be, well, how, first of all, you have to ask, well, what is death, right? Because it, depending on what you think about what death is, um, death being this, natural but also unnatural thing at the same time and what uh, what effect does death have on a soul and for the whole all of the values of continuity of what god has for us i feel like having a sense of um this this interim state being a place where that continuity has to be articulated in some way <laughs> is pretty important for the resurrection itself, right? And to even understand what death is. We talk about death being a curse and death being this and death being that. Um, but if in, our, if in our articulation of the Christian hope, we're not articulating kind of the, the, the end of death before the end of death, <laughs> then, uh, you know, kind of a play on, on, on Tom Wright's, um, you know, the life after life after death, <laughs> um, then you, then you really don't have a sense of what is, has been accomplished in the resurrection itself. And I think in there, you have to have a, a strong theology on the descent, uh, the Christ descent, the dead, um, and, you know, a lot of the basic questions that people ask, well, what about the people before Christ? What about my grandma? What about... <laughs> so, um, 
I, as, as you can tell, I, I was particularly fond of this chapter because I, I, I felt like there was a sense of, of shedding some light on some categories that I wasn't able to parse out on my own. So you did, you did a service. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. you. Appreciate that. Um, well, what a delight it was to talk to you, Joshua. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yes, I did as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So this is your host, Amy Brown Hughes with OnScript. We've been enjoying a conversation today with Joshua Ferris, the Chester and Margaret Pollock Professor at Mundelein Seminary at the University of St. Mary of the Lake. Joshua has written An Introduction to Theological Anthropology, Humans, Both Creaturely and Divine, published by Baker Academic. You can find a link to his book on our website, onscript.study. Thank you for joining me today, friends. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate. 